Hello everyone, welcome back to I Care For Your Brain with board certified neuropsychologist, Dr. Karen Sullivan. Today we're gonna to talk about the top five reasons that you might be referred to a neuropsychologist. A neuropsychologist is a clinical psychologist with expertise in the brain and behavior. We get our expertise from our education, from our training, and from our license to practice psychology and all that comes along with that. We are probably the best brain health partner you've never heard of. That's part of why I have been out here on social media for the last five years is to increase awareness about what an amazing partner a neuropsychologist can be for your brain health challenge. We are experts in assessment. What we like to do is provide objective measurement of cognition, mood, and behavior. So when I say cognition, what I'm really talking about is your ability to pay attention, your processing speed, your ability to multitask, your ability to learn, remember, find your words, understand language, and perceive visuospatial information. We finish five to six years of grad school, a one-year pre-doctoral internship, a two-year postdoctoral fellowship, and like I said before, we have a license to practice psychology, which has its own rules and regulations and exams that comes along with that. Many neuropsychologists specialize in pediatrics or older adults. I am on the older adult side of thing, and in my practice, I focus on age-related cognitive disorders. I get dozens of referrals every month from primary care providers and neurologists asking me questions about their patients. And so what I've done is summarized these requests into the top five so you might get a better understanding of the types of patients that a neuropsychologist like me sees. There are three parts to a neuropsychological evaluation. The first part is about an hour. This is what we call the diagnostic or the clinical interview. This is ideally with you and someone who knows you well, and we get a chance to have a nice in-depth conversation about any concerns you might have, your loved one might have, what you've been noticing over time, anything that you're fearful of might not be related to normal aging. What we're trying to do is establish a pattern of anything that's been going on that's outside of what is normal for you and how that's affected your function. We also have a lot of questions about your background and your history and your everyday life because it all matters. Brain health conversations take time and there's so much that goes into it. The second part is testing with either the doctor themselves or a well-trained technician. This can take up to two to four hours, and the goal here is to give paper and pencil and computerized cognitive and psychological examination so we can understand how you're doing in relationship to your peer group. So that is we have statistical information on folks who are just like you, your same age, your same education, and sometimes even down to the same hand you use for your dominant writing. We're trying to compare a group of people who are normally aging to you so that way we can make conclusions about whether you fall in that group or something more significant is happening to you, perhaps the process of one of the many subtypes of dementia. So what we're going to do is talk about those top five reasons. The number one reason you might be referred to a neuropsychologist is that someone is worried. That could be you, yourself, or a loved one. You might have noticed changes that worry you. Like I said before, the most helpful thing is if there's been more than one event, a pattern of changes in the way you're thinking, in the way you're remembering, the way you feel that your brain is working. This can also impact the way you feel. These things can be very frustrating. They can cause depression. They can cause anxiety. You might be particularly concerned if you're feeling that you're not as able to be quite as independent as you used to be in your everyday life. So if you need more assistance or more support from somebody in your life, that's a really good reason to come see a doctor like us, especially if things like remembering where your money is, remembering how to take your medications exactly like you're prescribed, or trouble with driving, getting into trouble with little fender benders here in a way that is not typical for you. Someone you know and trust is in a really good position to actually come in and help you with your neuropsychological evaluation because they know you for a long time. They kind of know what's normal for you and what's not. And sometimes we have conditions in brain and behavior studies that aren't 
as accessible to people's conscious awareness. So sometimes we really do get excellent information from what we call informants. So these are people, again, that know you well, that aren't there to try to be insensitive or make you feel bad. They're just usually worried that there's something going on with you. And if we're not calling it out and evaluating it, maybe you're not getting the proper medical care that you need, or maybe there's even something treatable that if your doctors aren't aware, they're just not gonna know to look for it. And your cognition, your mood, your everyday life could potentially be improved significantly. I can also tell you that when someone is worried, whether it's you or a loved one, and you don't have answers, that is the cause for some pretty significant anxiety to the point of being totally debilitating. I have seen plenty of older folks who are so worried that they are losing memory or they're developing dementia that that anxiety actually becomes so preoccupying, they develop a secondary cognitive symptom, which is an inability to focus on the here and now because they're really catastrophizing or over-interpreting normal blips that happen during the course of everyday life, never mind if you're 20 or 80 years old. The second reason you might see a neuropsychologist is if you have a medical condition that has some impact on the brain. So many medical conditions either directly or indirectly affect brain function, psychological function, how we're adjusting. Some of these things are very obvious, like a stroke or TBI, traumatic brain injury, or Parkinson's disease but other things you might not necessarily think of. And the way I'd like you to consider this is anything that interrupts the main fuel that brain cells need to operate is a great reason to come see us. So the two ones I want you to think about are oxygen and glucose. So anything that is related to respiratory issues, blood vessel health, anything that affects circulation and the amount of blood and oxygen that can get to your brain, those things are worthy of a neuropsychological evaluation. Also significant mental health challenges, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, all of those conditions have cognitive symptoms. They're not just the way you feel, they're also related to the way you think, your ability to make decisions clearly, your ability to focus and remember. And so sometimes we can be a really good partner in teasing apart what is brain versus maybe what's something going on with your mood in that artificial sense, because of course they're really two sides of the same coin. One of the most valuable things we offer to you as a neuropsychologist is education, an in-depth one hour conversation about your specific brain, what is specifically going on with you, how to understand it, how to put the pieces together. And what we really love to help you with is what does science tell us is the very best thing to do for someone with your specific situation, your specific symptoms. The results of our evaluation can help you make very important decisions about your life, your ability to work, your ability to be independent, what kind of support or care you need, not only for your own benefit, but sometimes one of those informants or people in our life, they have questions too, and they have some anxiety about not knowing what it is exactly we need. I'm thinking here of adult children of older adults sometimes live a few states away and they're just not quite sure if they're doing right by mom. So sometimes an evaluation can also help ease their anxiety. We can help you understand your strengths and your weaknesses and how to accommodate the weaknesses with the strengths. And we also provide an excellent map for future treatment. So if you're working with a physical therapist or a speech therapist, we're able to provide this really comprehensive understanding of exactly where they need to target their interventions. Number three reason you might see a neuropsychologist is if you have a family history of some type of brain health condition, specifically dementia. So as we age, we have two different types of risk factors for less than optimal brain health. We have our modifiable risk factors and our non-modifiable. The non-modifiable means there's really nothing you can do about it. And these are age and genetics, okay? Age is the biggest risk factor for dementia. About one third of people 85 or older will meet criteria for dementia, but this is not a normal part of aging. And we see plenty of people well into their 90s and beyond who have no degree of cognitive impairment whatsoever. 
Within the genetic risk factors for dementia, you can think about mutations and predispositions. Mutations are the type of genetic changes, the, the directions that our DNA has for our biological lifespan. Those are very, very difficult uh, to change without any type of genetic therapy um, going in and changing the programming of cells. These are the types of dementia that people tend to get at a much younger age, and really there was nothing that they did throughout the course of their lifestyle or through their uh, different um, uh, environment that activated those genes. It's just kind of the DNA that they were born with, and there's very little that can be done. That is the minority of people with dementia. Those are people who have what we call family-related Alzheimer's, and most people who have the early onset version of Alzheimer's that happens before age 60. But most of us are in the other category. We have some type of family history due to a genetic predisposition which is a genetic tendency that is activated through lifestyle or environment. And this is where neuropsychology can really help because we know what these modifiable risk factors are, okay? So you've got the non-modifiable, which is the genetic piece. There's not much we can do about that, really nothing, uh, unless you're involved at a high-level clinical trial. And then we've got all of these things that we actually know do turn on the genes for dementia. So these are things related to cardiovascular health, um, things related to um, not exercising enough, low education, low cognitive engagement, smoking, too much alcohol, air pollution, multiple traumatic brain injuries. There's all, you know, there's about 12 to 15 that we commonly evaluate in our patients untreated sleep apnea, uh, poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, um, you know, depression that's not well controlled despite taking medication. Our job is to really figure out what are the modifiable risk factors that map onto you as an individual and then give you that education about how to turn it around and make them better. So to me, I think that is invaluable advice. Number four is that you might want a cognitive baseline. As we age, we are told that there are all sorts of medical tests that we need, right? You need a mammogram, you need a colonoscopy, you need a bone density test. So why is it that we don't think about preventative and early identification of brain health challenges in the same way. So I try to go out in the world and promote that because I think if people knew neuropsychology was here as a resource, they would be requesting it more often. A few years ago, we had the cognitive assessment and cognitive care plan mandate incorporated into the Medicare annual wellness visit. And this says, all people over the age of 65 should get a cognitive screening test and have a conversation with their doctor once a year about their own cognitive concerns or those concerns of a family member and then make a cognitive plan if this is necessary. We see adherence to this mandate in as low as 10% and as high as 95%. It really depends where your doctor or your healthcare organization fits in. If you are concerned about your cognitive health, you have a right to go to your primary care doctor, to your neurologist, and ask them for a referral to a neuropsychologist. Most providers have someone that they are familiar with locally that has a good reputation, that they know sees patients in a comprehensive manner and you know has a good bedside approach and is empathic. If your primary care doctor or neurologist doesn't, one of the things we offer here at I Care For Your Brain is you can message us with your zip code and we will find you the best local provider, okay? A board certified neuropsychologist. Baseline testing for cognition is extremely helpful in tracking future concerns or changes. Part of that is that we're always using that peer matched comparison. So we can say at the age of 65, this is how we expect a woman with a bachelor's degree to do on our test. And then if we see her again three years down the road, we're able to say this is how a woman who is age 67 with a bachelor's degree can do. And this is how we answer the question, are cognitive changes normal? normal for age, or could they be the beginning of a dementing process? And that, for me as an age-related neuropsychologist, is probably the most common question that I get. And many times I'm able to reassure folks that they don't have anything going on now. Our tests are extremely sensitive, as simple as they can sometimes see, seem, just simple paper and pencil tests. They're actually based on extremely uh, 
current and well done neuroscientific research. And we know that we're measuring very specific brain functions by asking people to do relatively simple things. So my job is to, when I can and when it's appropriate, reassure, or try to diagnose what is the most specific brain health challenge that the person is going through and then guide them through to the next steps of who are the best professionals, what is the best treatment, what is the best self-care that they can possibly do. Number five, the final reason is if you have been under medical care for something, uh, specifically mental health I find is the most common, for a long time, but you have not had relief. Maybe the truth is, is that you have been barking up the wrong tree and that there is a brain health component to what it is you're going to, and you would really benefit from the specialist of a brain behavior expert. Therapy is certainly a beneficial thing for everyone, I would argue, but there are certain brain health challenges that can make traditional therapy difficult to make progress in or to not see the type of symptom relief that you really deserve, that you really need to live your best life. So sometimes people have undiagnosed brain health challenges that have a very big influence on the way they can take in information and therapy, the way they can act on the recommendations and they can't live the life of the highest quality. So a lot of times I'm thinking of like undiagnosed attention deficit disorder, undiagnosed autism spectrum disorders. If you are someone who has always struggled with feeling different or trouble with attention or learning, you know, even something like bad with faces can never remember people that you've met in the past there is a chance that maybe you have an undiagnosed brain health challenge and a neuropsychologist can provide that assessment to get you the clarity that you need to get the very best help possible. I have diagnosed many people over the age of 65 with a developmental learning disability. So what that means is they had it from the beginning of time, but they grew up in a schooling system, an education system that didn't screen for cognitive differences, that didn't look at learning disabilities, learning disorders, learning changes. This didn't really happen until the 1970s and probably not in earnest with any type of government regulation until the 1990s. So if you are over 65, there is a significant chance you, if you have struggled with something like spelling or reading, uh, reading speed, reading comprehension, you know, there's a chance that there's something unique there about you that you deserve to understand as it might inform your current brain health experiences. This is a talk that I have really enjoyed putting together for you. I hope it gives you more insight into what expertise a neuropsychologist can offer you. And remember, even though there's not a lot of us, chances are there's one relatively close to you. And now with telehealth becoming more and more accepted in the world, chances are we will be able to find you somebody you could partner with to better understand your brain. Really put yourself in the driver's seat of your own advocacy. Take care, thanks so much, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.